Hello everyone. This lecture is about drones and the use of drones in research and higher education. My name is Joe Straw and I will be your guide and drone pilot. In this video there will be a mixture of me speaking to camera, drone footage and PowerPoint slides that have been converted into film or video. There will be examples of some specific uh, use cases for drones in research and higher education. This video lecture deals with these questions and topics. What is a drone? And specifically, what is meant by a drone in the context of this lecture? How can I use drones in research and teaching? What specific potential use cases there might there be, particularly in research fields and academic disciplines that we could refer to as social science in a broad sense of the term? What kind of technical potentials and limitations do we have when using drones? And, as we will see, how some of these limitations actually can be turned to our advantage. Regulatory matters, ethical concerns, however, it will not be an exhaustive study of the ethical concerns. And then, following this, there will be a so-called outro, where I list references as is befitting a academic video lecture, which is similar to an academic article. Credits and uh, thanks for those that uh, were involved in some way or another, perhaps knowingly or unknowingly. So, choose your metaphor. Sit back and get ready, get ready to watch and listen, or buckle up, or whatever metaphor, because here we go. The home point has been updated. Please check it on the map. In the past, it was prohibitively expensive for some people in higher education and research to get aerial views, or it was in fact, in some cases, more or less impossible. The researcher or the instructor in higher education then would have to charter a helicopter, an aircraft, to be able to get the pictures or the films that they wanted to have. Of course, if you are teaching cartography, aerial photography interpretation, geography, remote sensing, etc., these kinds of things were integral to your research and to your education, what you were teaching. And so this meant, of course, that that was budgeted and you were used to working with that. And if you had a large enough research grant, you could purchase satellite imagery and you could, in some cases, even pay to have the satellite tip at a slight angle to get pictures at particular periods of time where it might require a few days of orbits before you were going over that particular spot on Earth that you were interested in. During the mid to uh, later part of the 2010s, the decade of 2010 to 2019 or so, this started to change. Drones got progressively cheaper. They got uh, more capable. More electronics could be put into the drone and they became accessible to increasingly large numbers of people. In aerial photography, satellite imagery, and so forth, drones then seem to be something that could be naturally to be used and something we could just sort of progress and evolve into their use. Drones emerged as something which could sort of fill a gap in between these large areas by satellite or by aircraft that would cover large areas and be expensive versus being time-consuming and sending large numbers of people in a landscape to make observations. The drone could easily be 100 meters above the ground and take pictures or fly over and create films in a way which would be less expensive than uh, the satellite imagery or the aerial photography and involve many fewer people than those doing field observations seemingly perhaps having some sort of so-called sweet spot between two different kinds of technology. 
What you're watching now is the use of a drone uh, in the fall and the autumn in October of 2022 in the northern part or near the northeastern part of Lund, Sweden, and we can see the fall foliage. The drone is uh, about 20-30 meters up above the ground. This drone, which I own, is a so-called sub-250 gram category drone. More appropriately, we should perhaps call it a quadcopter, an autonomous aerial vehicle with four um, uh, motors and using the helicopter blades to fly. In many jurisdictions, drones that are uh, in many jurisdictions in many jurisdictions, drones that weigh less than 250 grams are subject to very little uh, regulation. In many places in the world, you do not need a drone pilot license, and there is less regulation about locations where you can fly your drone as opposed to larger and heavier drones. This makes the, it make relatively easy to use the drone, portable, easy to take around. That's an advantage. A disadvantage is that the image quality in general is going to be poorer and the features that you can include in the drone, drone will not be as, as good as the larger drones. Additionally, the flight time will be shorter and the speed at which the drone can fly at top speed will be much lower than in more shall we say, higher quality drones. I have a DJI Mini 2 since May of 2021. Of course, there's not only the question about the cost of the drone uh, and the cost associated with it. If, if if you are the only one who's going to be flying the drone in education or research projects, then that means that things are rather limited. You only have one person to get the license, only one person to register the drone. However, if it's a research project involving several years and several people, and the drone is much larger, then you're going to require a multitude of people to get a drone pilot license, perhaps. And when it comes to students, then there's the question of perhaps insurance. What happens if they crash the drone on somebody um, or they otherwise damage it uh, and the need for them to get licenses as well? Uh, I will return to this later in this lecture, this video lecture. So I talked a bit about what a drone is and my drone very briefly. Uh, but I think we need to look a little more closely, a little more carefully, and understand the various terms used to talk about unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs, uh, and that there are various types, so there's not so much confusion that we might have here. Now, if you want to read more on your own about the history of drones, misconceptions, uh, that exist in society about drones. Uh, here are two articles that you can um, read at your leisure. The full references will be available at the end of this video lecture as befitting an academic kind of video lecture, that there are references at the end. And in fact, um, parts of this video lecture are based on some of the references what are brought up there, and of course based on some of my own personal experiences and skill development. So what is a drone? In this video lecture, the colloquial term is being used, the term that most people often use, an unmanned aerial vehicle, or UAV, that is intended primarily for peaceful uses. As I mentioned before, it is a quadcopter, perhaps a hexacopter with six sets of propellers instead of just four. Uh, and it has a reasonably good camera mounted on it. It has a, and connected and piloting this drone is a particular person. 
uh, and this person may or may not be required to have a license. And uh, the drone probably cannot lift and carry a payload, or if it could, it would be a very small amount. There are commercially operated drones uh, weighing several kilos that could perhaps also lift a kilo and deliver it someplace. But that is something that I'm not interested in, and I think you're not interested in by looking at this video. The drone can fly from the pilot several kilometers away, perhaps as much as 10 kilometers away, if there is no obstruction for radio transmission. The uh, pictures and the videos can be transferred to the pilot or can be stored on a memory card in the drone or both, uh, depending upon the drone type, the drone manufacturer, and uh, so forth and the like. On the other hand, we have military drones, and we also have drones that were intended for a civilian market that are used by the military, and that military developments can have driven or helped influence civilian developments when it comes to uh, drones used in, in a more commercial sector or by private people. So we have drones that are in a gray zone, drones only used by military, drones meet, repurposed for military purposes, like Ukrainian defense forces trying to defend their country up against the war started by Vladimir Putin, um, and the like. Now some of these drones, and you can see information and pictures here to the side of me, they often look a lot more like aircraft with wings. And there is a push or pull propeller system. In this particular uh, picture, uh, and the information and picture is from Wikipedia, we see an unmanned aerial vehicle in the military sense of what a drone is, uh, which has a wingspan of over 20 meters. It takes off and lands like an airplane, whereas as opposed to my drone in the more civilian kind of uh, thinking about is more like a helicopter. Uh, and this particular, uh, well, military aircraft um, can fly at top speeds of several hundred kilometers an hour. It can reach a, uh, the highest uh, altitude of 15 kilometers and according to various sources can be, one, outfitted with miss small missiles as needed and not just be used for surveillance, uh, but also um, can, as some sources say, loiter around a particular area for many, many hours at a time. And at 15 kilometers up is not going to be detected in, unless it's some other kind of military service and an opposing force that could perhaps detect it. So this is quite different than a less than 250 gram quadcopter that I own and use. And yet we speak about sometimes both of these types of UAVs as drones, which leads to some sort of misconceptions and uh, incorrect and inaccurate thinking about what is meant by a drone in some sort of circumstances. Now, to be sure, as I said, the driving force for creating a lot of drones has been military uses, and then this has then been made available to a more civilian sector, to a more commercial sector, and to the use of drones by private people. At the same time, there still is a military connection because the manufacturer of the greatest number of um, commercial drones and small private drones, like the kind I use, uh, is located in a country where there's a strong connection between the military and the commercial sector. Uh, you can figure it out yourself. Now, if you're going to follow the discourse about logistics and e-commerce and so forth, say from around the year 2015 and forward, perhaps even earlier than that, uh, in transport management and logistical studies in universities and in academic literature provided at the time, there was a certain hype about how drones were going to be used in logistics in the future. And there were certain case studies which were talked about 
and the sky is open to all these fantastic technical developments. Now this coincided in time, or perhaps slightly after, uh, with other kind of so-called disruptive companies and disruptive technologies, all seemingly coming out of California and the United States, like Uber, Airbnb, and the like, the so-called disruptive companies that will give consumers what they want, break up old quasi-monopolies and oligopolies, and we have this brave new world in front of us, despite the fact that there is a backside to all of these developments and there are social costs. Uh, but that's maybe something in another lecture someplace. We also have a certain hype about self-driving cars that was coming out at about the same time. Here we are in uh, March 2023, and this brave new world of drones and e-commerce and logistics has by and large evaporated and has failed to materialize, with the exception of some very specialized use cases in some particular countries and in some particular locations. We can say that it has really not taken off. There was a pun intended there. And these ideas, in fact, were not all that very realistic. Uh, and there are numerous videos on the internet which can explain why this is not very realistic. And I could talk about that, but with this would make this uh, video lecture much longer and off topic. Um, so, um, of course, it could be 2028 or something like that, and you're watching this video and you look at me and you laugh, ha ha, all these obstacles that exist at the time have been avoided. Um, yeah. And now, through the magic of video editing, let us let future Joe continue with the lecture. I have a number of questions which I'm trying to answer in this video lecture, as you know, and to the questions that we see here. I think that for practical purposes, we might be able to collapse these down into just one question about the use of drones in uh, our universities for our research and for our teaching of students, because there is a certain amount of overlap that takes place there. Now, we can already imagine drones being used for research or practical purposes in agriculture, silviculture, but also in monitoring environmental quality or various kinds of environmental problems. This is all very much natural science oriented. And for some researchers and teachers in those kinds of fields, it would be sort of natural to begin to use drone technology as an integral part of their research and their teaching. And for those of you who are uh, teaching and researching in non-natural science fields, you might need sort of some sort of help to understand the potential of using drones. Drones can be used to film rather risky situations or the aftermath of kind of, shall we say, risky situations. Uh, and in uh, the end of February, I had a possibility of doing some drone filming at a particular location, which we'll be seeing now.
As you can imagine, this video has taken a fair amount of time to make and produce. In January, February and March 2023, I went out and did various kinds of footage and filming and so forth specifically for this particular YouTube video, this particular video lecture. On the other hand, you have seen other things which I have taken from previous drone flights and previous pictures, uh, not with the intention of making this. Something which you may have noticed during this video is what could be referred to as a continuity error that I'm not always wearing the exact same wardrobe, which also explains that this has been done at different times in different locations. I'm not a Tom Scott YouTuber who always wears a red t-shirt when he is uh, talking to the camera. Now, if you found this video interesting and of value to you, you might consider providing comments back to me because that would provide value to me as some sort of non-monetary exchange. On YouTube, frequently people write comments like, great video, Joe, and include a thumbs up or an emoji. That's fine, but consider that this is perhaps a more academically oriented video lecture, and we might want to get some more academic comments and more questions and so forth. And that would be, as some YouTubers talk about, that would lead to a conversation strange use of the term conversation. Also, if you like this video, despite the fact that there might be some sort of advertisements that appear in it, you could uh, consider liking and you could consider subscribing to the channel. This provides not feedback necessarily to me, but feedback to the YouTube algorithm, which might mean that more people might find this particular video and this particular channel. If you do decide to subscribe to the channel to see similar kind of content, either having to do with using hybrid technology in higher education, for example, or in other things having to do with environmental studies in a broader perspective, then consider touching the bell in the subscribe option. And why would you want to do that, you ask? Well, those of people who watch a lot of YouTube know that. Uh, because when you're a subscriber to the channel, or any channel, you won't know there's a new video there if you haven't tapped the bell. The bell, depending upon the settings, will permit you to get a message or a symbol on your cell phone letting you know that there is a new video that you could watch, or you might have it set that you get an email. Otherwise, you might not know specifically that new content has arrived. I don't post a tremendous amount of content on this channel. But uh, from time to time, there might be something interesting to watch. Now, if you know me personally, as, say, a colleague or a former colleague, uh, you're also welcome to write something uh, on the channel and not just send me an email or talk to me afterwards. Uh, you can do both. That would be great. Uh, I'll be providing timestamps in the video down below. And if you ask, uh, hey, Joe, what's a timestamp? Uh, ask me that, and then you'll get an explanation. Finally, I cannot know what quality in the video that you have, what your video settings are. Uh, YouTube tends to lower the quality of the video uh, that is sent out, uh, so I can only apologize if your setting is at 720, things might be a little soft, or even worse, at 480. Uh, you can use the cogwheel to change the video quality setting, uh, and if you need to, you could make that change in the setting and start from the beginning if you think the video quality was very poor. Drone footage might suddenly look even better if you've gone from 480 to 1080 or whatever it is. Some of the drone footage was filmed at 1440. And if you don't know what those numbers are, ask in the comments below. And now back to the rest of the video lecture. There are larger drones compared to this little one here, which fits essentially in one hand. Now, there are much larger drones, of course, drones which uh, are 5 or 10 kilos in weight and can take a payload with them, and that can have either specifically designed cameras which record outside of the visible spectrum of light, um, or where you might be able to swap out one camera for another for various kinds of purposes. Um, and then the cameras that you have mounted on the drone like that might be something about this size instead. 
So with drones like that, it might be possible to monitor the heat loss from buildings, and you would be able to get three-dimensional views of that by flying the drone in various locations around the building, including looking straight down on it. You will be able to use other drones to be able to uh, monitor uh, gases that are in uh, emissions from factories or from an accident or a derailed vehicle or something like that from a considerable distance. Um, perhaps something which we're not going to be doing very often in social science research. <clears throat> and otherwise we could fly to locations that could be dangerous for humans or would put the human operator in, in a compromised situation. That's one of the reasons why we might be interested in using drones for, shall we say, natural science kinds of applications or emergency rescue or health and public service kind of uh, purposes. Now all of those specific kind of drones I'm talking about are much heavier and as soon as you have a drone that is more than 250 grams in weight in most places around the world, the amount of regulation and the requirements placed on the drone pilot starts to increase a lot. Uh, and that could mean that for you, a uh, sub-250 gram drone might be exactly what you want because it will provide you with a certain amount of flexibility and something that you can learn from and in some, in some situations, as we will see when it comes to social science uh, research and teaching, could be exactly what you need, even though it doesn't have the highest quality sensor in it. So now that I've covered all these particular points, we can start to get to more the central part of the video having to do with the use of drones in uh, non-natural uh, science kinds of settings, not for cartography, not for remote sensing and the like. Things that are more social science kind of oriented or areas where aerial photography is not being used, where in these natural science areas where aerial photography is used, it's the potential that the users, the researchers, already are thinking about drones and start using it naturally. In this circumstance that I want to talk about, it's sort of like a jump in understanding to be able to see the potential to use drones. And what kind of areas am I talking about that um, could be of interest? What kind of research fields? What kind of academic disciplines? What kind of teaching programs? Well, I'm listing several here. And my list is not in any way exhaustive, I would suggest. Um, but um, in, instead could be sort of food for thought and can form some of the rest of this uh, video lecture. There are of course overlapping here. We can see that urban planning and architecture, for example, in some ways could overlap. Transport urban planning could also overlap. And you might have, uh, by the end of this video lecture, thought of some completely different area that I haven't thought about. And I might have been able to include that, but then this would have been much longer than it already is, of course, which is probably already long enough. So let's begin with architecture. Here we can see part of a city street in Lund, Sweden, during January 2023, with some buildings. This was filmed using one of my system cameras, the Panasonic Lumix G9. We can then look at two of the buildings in some of the shots that we're seeing here. I was standing in a park across the street. Let us suppose that I'm interested in this particular building. I can, of course, stand on the sidewalk and I can take some pictures. And with a telephoto lens of the right kind, I can get at some distance rather close-ups of part of the building that I would want. But I would be at ground level looking up. And that would mean that maybe it isn't the perspective that I want to have and maybe I don't have a telephoto lens that is good enough. I want to have some pictures or films of this particular building which will be essentially impossible to achieve without renting a crane and being elevated a few stories up in the crane and blocking off traffic on the streets to be able to take some of the pictures. Of course alternatively I might be able to convince people living in an apartment in a building nearby that I could walk into their living room and open the windows and take some shots, but I might not be able to get that permission. Here we can see that I can fly the drone around parts of the building and get perspectives that would be impossible from the ground and impossible from a nearby building. Indeed, if I was out in the park, 
and was 15 meters up, which would be impossible, uh, I wouldn't be able to film certain things because it would just there's no neighboring uh, building that I could be in and take a picture from there. And the trees are in the way if I would have been in the park. Let's demonstrate another possibility. Here we are further up the street towards the center of town, the medieval center of the city of Lund. Um, and um, let's look at this building, at least the top of it, and I'm going to let the drone take a spin, so to speak. This permits us to do at least two things that would be very difficult, if not impossible to do. First off, we can see the building in real time from various angles in a way that will be difficult to achieve otherwise. Secondly, it establishes and puts the building in a context, in this case, January 2023, in this particular city. That would also be very difficult to achieve. It was more lifelike than, say, making a model and then spinning the model and taking a picture uh, or filming that. Now, of course, we can have digitalized models of buildings and we can have them with various kinds of software and we can examine things from various kinds of angles. But this requires that the dimensions uh, and so forth of the building are digitized. And there are a number of historical buildings that are not monumental buildings, uh, but which appear in various places that are not digitized and which we would have difficulty and spend a lot of time to be able to make correct models of them and um, look at them and so forth, and then put them in a context of other buildings in another model. It's possible to do that. Uh, but it would also probably be just in black and white, and here we have in color, and we can decide at any given point in time, as long as we can have the drone up and the battery is still working, uh, we can decide at what elevation, at what angle we want to look at things, and we could do several flights of the same building. And if we run out of battery, we can land the drone, we can swap out the battery, and we can send it up again and continue. Um, I have three batteries, which gives me, uh, um, if the weather and so forth is okay, I have approximately 20 minutes of flight time per battery, which means that with sending the drone up and, and so forth like that, during an hour and a half, I could have the equivalent of one hour of actual footage if I needed that. Bigger drones, longer flight times, and so forth. So we can see that the drone can capture relatively distorted free images and videos. I'm not confined to being on the street level and looking up. I can look at exactly what it would look like from that particular vantage point. What else could we do with drones that could be of interest in teaching and, and learning and research in higher education? We can establish the um, historical buildings, monumental historical buildings, and place them in a context. Uh, so this could perhaps also be something which could be used in a subject, say, like history. We could also use a drone to study parts of buildings which are in need of renovation or follow the renovation process in places that would be difficult to achieve to take pictures. We could also use the drone to fly slowly through particular locations to mimic the way it would be as if I or you were walking along the street. The drone would be flying and say one and a half, two meters above the street level, or in this case, the courtyard of a historical building, and, um, and then you can get a sort of perspective of what everything looks like. Sort of like a Google Maps where they have the Google car where they take pictures at particular points, but this is a continuous kind of flow of movement in a film. Uh, so let's um, move to other possible use areas. We see some new shots and footage from around the same time in Lund in, uh, in uh, 2023. A whole month of uh, January was other rather, otherwise rather gray and misty, and the light was a bit flat. 
Plus, if it's too misty or foggy when my drone is up 100 meters in the sky, uh, then some of the scene could be obscured or will become fuzzy as I'm looking through the fog and so forth. So your location in the world may impact when you can more easily use a drone. Besides inclement weather, also times of day might be better or worse for flying a drone. And if you have a question about that, you can ask in the comments below. <clears throat> Suppose you want to survey the movement of people in a public space. This is a small park or square close to the central train station in Lund, and this area is called Bontoyot, for those that are familiar with this place. And the drone is about 120 meters up its maximum elevation, its maximum altitude, at least legal maximum altitude. And it's more or less taking in the entire area. If I would let it hover, say, for 15 minutes or so, then I, or if you were the researcher, or if you were teaching something that required this, you could get a snapshot view, snapshot view of the movement of people. It's not showing you all movement of all people during the day, but it's showing you at a particular time of the day, particular time of year, what does the usage of this space look like. And you can see, you could plot where people are going from various locations in the viewed area. <clears throat> at the same time, Given the elevation and the relatively low resolution of the camera, it is impossible to identify the individuals. So some of our eth ethical considerations and our GDPR considerations, if we're in the EU, might not be applicable here. Of course, I could put four or five students in various locations, say, in the corners and one person in the middle with the uh, notepads and recording things uh, and so forth. They could also be equipped with cameras, um, but then of course they would be able to see the faces of the people. But we would be able to plot the movements of the people that way. We might miss some people uh, because there could be a lot of people, but uh, when we have recorded something using the drone, we can start and stop the footage and record everything. It would be time consuming, but we would miss nothing. Here is another example. Same city, but a different location and in the summer. What we are looking at is a recycling and waste management center in Lund, Sweden. We can see the various stations to unload household waste and the movement of the people at the facility. Uh, my drone is not quite as high as 100 meters uh, altitude or elevation above the recycling center. Uh, but still, it's impossible to identify the individuals or read the registration plate numbers on their cars. The camera quality, the sensor quality, is quite good enough for the purposes of being able to follow what's taking place at this recycling center, if that's what we're interested in a research project, or if we want to demonstrate something for students in our teaching. We could have a short film and could talk about this with our students. If I wanted to identify people, for example, which obviously I don't want to do, but if that was important, then I could drop down the drone a bit and have a drone with a higher quality sensor, and I would reach the point where I might be able to identify people. But if I plan my drone flight and have my understanding about drones and their possible uses and and their possible abuses, um, I can make sure that I can't identify people. Let's go on to transport or transportation. We can get overviews of situations that would not be possible from the ground, and this is somewhat similar to architectural uh, teaching and learning and research, and urban planning teaching and learning and research. We can demonstrate circumstances for students, we can film traffic flow, we can film traffic congestion, we could, for traffic engineers, um, we, we could have what was intended to occur with the modeling, and then we can compare that to actual filming of what happened. It's not quite the same thing as having measurement cables to measure the number of vehicles you can actually see in real time. We can also see how various vehicles fit into an urban setting such as if you're going to put a tram line 
into a city that was built during the Middle Ages and what it actually ended up looking like and uh, what occurred. When it comes to urban planning, of course, uh, we can also use this in a way of like the sociology, sociology and, and ethnography that I was talking about, about the using of, of um, public spaces and how the city is used and perceived by individuals. But here, also besides this, I'm showing the possibility of flying close to street level and not having the drone pointed downward, as I did in some of the previous films. We can see the drone with the camera more to like at a 45 degree angle and I'm walking along and the drone is sort of following me as the subject and of course I'm not walking in an entirely natural way because I have the drone controller and I'm checking to make sure that I'm in view and I'm piloting the drone and so forth. Uh, we have several elevations uh, at about 5 meters up and then about 10 meters up and then about 20 meters up and at certain distances with the drone being further and further away from me as it is filming to demonstrate the various kinds of options that would be possible. Now my drone, which is a DJI Mini 2, does not have a built-in tracking feature where the drone could otherwise track the movement of something and the drone pilot then would not have to take uh, take um, and the drone pilot wouldn't have to deal with that just make sure that the drone doesn't crash into anything in these kinds of advanced tracking features on drones which um, there are a variety of different features that are possible not just following in a straight line but following an individual while the drone is looping around the individual, for example. Anyway, the drone locks onto the moving object, a person, a car, and keeps the tracked object close to the center of the screen. Um, you can have a non-moving uh, object, a stationary object, which can be, uh, can, uh, be locked onto, in essentially in all drones, like in, in my drone, uh, like I used um, for the volcano on La Palma and like I used in the building when I circled around it in uh, Central Lund. You can also fly them manually to do that um, if, if the drone is having difficulty locking on to the, the subject and flying in a circle. And it would be possible, as I showed in the historical castle Svanaholm, it would also be possible to fly your drone at one and a half, two meters elevation above the street level and fly it around as if it was the person's, as if it was a person's view walking around in the city and observing various things. We can see some of this at a human perspective level at a pocket park in Lund. And then we can see some uh, perspectives from flying around in a, the city park in Lund in the summer of 2022. <laughs> And finally, we can see some flying over an area which looks like a suburb, which is part of the town of Dalby, located outside of Lund in Sweden, also from the summer of 2022. So let's sum up some of the things that I've talked about so far. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to the use of drones. Let's take a look at the advantages first. The drone provides a unique perspective. 
there are of course some limitations. We can take still photos and we can make films on demand and we can cover a wider area than conventional photography or videography. Uh, we can demonstrate or we can document things for students or for our own research. We can use them in projects that students carry out. We as a researcher can see certain perspectives or have an overview that would otherwise be difficult or impossible. What are certain disadvantages? Well, there is a certain cost to getting the drone. If it is an entry-level drone, which could be a good idea if you're not quite sure whether this is going to be useful or not, then the cost is borne by your organization, by your research project money, or whatever it is. And then suddenly the cost is very low. There are regulatory restrictions in various places around the world that might restrict to certain times of the day or certain times of the year where you can fly your drone, or there might be what we could call no-fly zones, where no drone flight is permitted in these locations at any time of the year for whatever reason. Or it could be that, for example, near an airport, uh, drone flight is permitted, uh, but uh, at only certain elevations or drone flight is completely prohibited around an airport. There are technical limitations when it comes to the drone. My drone is good enough for me for most purposes, but if some benefactor was interested in getting something better for me, uh, I wouldn't mind. Um, and of course there's also the potential of, of actually doing something drone when it comes to research. There are the ethical concerns, which I'll get back to. This is the third time I've said this and your competence and skills with regard to flying drones and photography, uh, two skills that you sort of have to have some sort of sense of to be able to pilot a drone and take pictures and take uh, videos uh, well. And the latter is something which, of course, you can uh, become better at. Uh, but if you have absolutely no idea about photography, uh, I think you should know a little bit about that before you start flying your drone around and trying to take some pictures. If you know me personally, we can talk about that. If not, comments below. I already showed you my DJI Mini 2, um, which has a 12 megapixel camera. This drone I bought in May of 2021, I think, and it had come out earlier in 2021 or the end of 2020 and replaced the G DJI Mini. Uh, DJI, DJI, I always say DGI, DJI is a Chinese manufacturer of, among other things, consumer and professional drones. And for your purposes, unless you have a specific natural science kind of purpose, uh, DJI has three lines of drones that might be interesting. Uh, the Mini, the Air, and the Mavic. They get bigger in size, they get bigger sensors, and they have longer flight times and uh, better image quality and, and so forth and so on. And as you've seen, if you think that the quality of these pictures and images are good enough, uh, then you know what is good enough to get. I also mentioned before it had a 12 megapixel sensor, uh, which if we consider that most uh, images these days are seen on a cell phone, or on a laptop, which is a 13 or a 15 or perhaps a 17 inch screen. We do, of course, have larger screens that can be seen on. Uh, but anything above nine megapixels is probably good enough for reasonably good quality in those kinds of circumstances. If I want to take a picture with a drone and mount it, a printed picture in uh, some public space that's going to be really big, then um, maybe my number of megapixels needs to be a bit greater. Uh, but there are also videos on YouTube telling you why, actually, uh, in many circumstances, you never need anything bigger than a 9 megapixel uh, sensor, depending upon the size of the sensor. So generally speaking, you're not allowed to fly your drone higher than 120 meters. Uh, and one of the main reasons for that is that everything above 120 meters is considered to be airspace that uh, commercial and private aircraft might be flying in. And so you don't want to be interfering with that kind of uh, fl flight that's taking place. Um, there are some places we're not allowed to fly around to. I believe I've talked about airports before. Um, uh, what else? Uh, military locations or other locations of national security interest. Prisons. National parks. 
and nuclear power plants. It's interesting, among all power plants that I understand, it's only nuclear power plants that are ones that have drone flight restrictions around them, perhaps because of the risky nature of activities taking place there, and uh, therefore we can ask uh, about, uh, and therefore we can see that perhaps drone regulations are pointing out how unsustainable nuclear power is. Oops, what else? Yes, um, in most jurisdictions, jurisdictions around the, the world, if your drone is under 250 grams, you do not need a drone pilot license, but you still must register your drone as in the same way that you would register your car or your boat or whatever it would be. Uh, and then there is what is referred to as VLOS, uh, and that means that you need to keep your vehicle in your line of sight. Now this depends upon the size of the drone, the bigger the drone, uh, and one which is, has a color which is, departs from the color of the sky, you can probably see at a considerable distance. In my case, depending upon the direction of the sun and so forth, uh, and, um, and like that, I can still see it within 300 meters, uh, but then beyond 400 meters it might become difficult. Everything I've talked about, uh, regulations uh, and so forth, based on this EU perspective, there can be some slight variations between EU countries, uh, and you need to know before you go, so don't use what I've been talking about here as what is thinking you know. So don't use what I've just talked about here as a, as a replacement for actually finding out what is a requirement and what the regulations are where you live and where you intend to operate the drone. So now turning to ethical considerations. I'm going to assume that your university has some sort of an ethics board. It could be for the whole university, it could be based on individual faculties, I don't know what it's like. And the ethics board is charged with the task of looking at various research proposals and you need to prepare certain documentation to show that you've taken sufficient ethical concern or perhaps not and the board tells you that and you need to redesign your research project. Some ethical boards in some parts of, of the world may also include, to varying degrees, some sort of teaching. Yeah, and there is the potential, of course, for there to be difficult situations and question, situ situations where we might need to question whether this research can be carried out in some other way or that the use of the drone could be limited. Quite clear and understandable that those could, circumstances could arise. And I can almost hear some people saying, but Joe, you're just making a video here and uh, you're using drone footage and so forth like that. What's going on here? Have you been in contact with the ethics board? The answer is no. And why is that? What you are now watching is a video which I have produced on my own time. I'm not working as a university employee here. I'm not being paid to do this. What does one call it? A labor of love or something like that. Um, the drone is mine. The system camera I'm recording on here is mine. The software which I use to edit, I have purchased myself. I don't use Adobe Premiere Pro, for example, that my university has provided for me. So all of this is being done as a private person. And if you look carefully at various kinds of regulations, the freedom of expression uh, and so forth in a country like Sweden is relatively great, or thus so far is, uh, for the private person to be able to say certain things. Um, there are still, of course, ethical considerations. There is the GDPR, but I'm not working as an inv a university employee right now. And I'm not keeping a list of people, and I'm not doing things where people are identifiable. So as a photographer and as a videographer, my, not my money-earning profession, but as my vocation, so to speak, I have certain ethical concerns and so forth that I have to keep track of, and I have to take consideration of, and have to make some sort of trade-offs here. Now, I am sure that you have taken thousands, if not tens of thousands, of pictures with your phone. And you may have taken some of these, and you have, may have posted some of these to social media. Did you have any ethical considerations when you did that? 
So suppose instead you would be using the drone as a university employee. And you might submit your research proposal, and I'll just talk about research proposals here right now, to the board. What kind of competence about drones do the members of the ethical board have? And so through ignorance, your proposal might be stopped. That's also a reason why I'm making this, because you might want to be able to point this out so that people sitting on an ethical board could learn, because that's one thing we need to do in a university. We need to constantly learn new things to keep up with the developments and to produce new developments with VR research. They might assume that the technical level of a particular drone, like mine, is so good that it would be damaging to the integrity of people that were walking around the city, which we can clearly see was not the case. When it came to the showing the people in the park where I was panning the drone around, I could have taken a system camera that I have and held it up like this at one point and just gone like that. Camera, camera, you have your cell phone, I have my system cameras, I have my drone. At some level, they're all the same. They are just digital sensors that are recording the reflection of light. Perhaps all of this has to do more with our expectations. Photographers around the world on YouTube talk about how if they walk around in a city and they're using their cell phone to take pictures of things, even a very sophisticated cell phone, security guards ignore them because they assume they're tourists. But as soon as the security guard sees something like this, then they come up and start asking questions about, do you have a permit? Even if the person is standing in a public space, but maybe is photo uh, taking a picture of a building which is owned by some company, which has a hyper-vigilant sense of what is security. Uh, they may have legitimate reasons for that. So if it's more a question about expectations in public space, look at these films right now, which I took a few days ago. Here we can see that I'm walking down into the train station in the city of Malmo, Malmo Central Station, and there's a camera. And then I'm taking the sort of moving escalator down towards platform three and four. And what do we see? There are security cameras watching my every move watching your every move. And as I continue down, there are more security cameras. They are all over the place. Now, of course, if it was on private property and it was only being filmed in that area, it's up to the property owner to decide what to do. But this is sort of like a public space, sort of. Uh, and uh, we seem to have gotten used to this kind of thing. What else have we gotten used to when it comes to our personal integrity and surveillance Essentially, everybody has some sort of a cell phone and somebody can monitor plus or minus a number of square meters approximately where we are all the time. Not what we're saying necessarily, but the sort of data where the phone is located. So those of us that are concerned about drones violating some kind of personal integrity, which I was at a park one place a few years ago and a drone swept by looking at me like that before I owned a drone. It's not a very pleasant experience. But it's all part of a series of different kinds of surveillance which is made possible during this century. Certain kinds of surveillance is regulated and we don't think about it so much. Other kinds of surveillance is also regulated but we're not used to seeing it. And every time we're exposed to something which we're not used to, something that's new, we feel, have a tendency to view this as dangerous and a problem. Now, according to some sources, some universities, especially in the United States, are limiting to the use of drones by staff and faculty. Uh, but there I have, uh, doing this, taken steps to try to avoid capturing faces of people in public settings. And in some cases, like the retired people that were waiting for other people to arrive in the park and start to play the bocce or bull game, I asked them whether it was okay for them to be filmed and whether it would be okay if this was on social media. And one of the women spoke for everybody. 
I'm so old it doesn't matter anymore. Okay, this was a rather long video, uh, but if you were one of my students, you would know that Joe sometimes makes reasonably long videos that the students can watch. And of course, if you have a 35 minute long lecture uh, and you're sitting in class, then that's no problem. On the other hand, you as a student, you can't uh, pause the lecture in real life and then press a play button and then start the lecture again. That's an advantage of having a recorded lecture. The students can watch it over and over again, stop it and watch parts of it again if they want to. And the same can be said here. Now, as in the lectures I provide to my students, I'm going to have this, uh, this uh, video lecture isn't quite done yet. There is what is referred to in the YouTube world as the outro. We have the intro to something, and then we have the outro. And the outro might be some sort of credits and other things. In this case, I'm going to show just some PowerPoint slides and other things that deal with some of the matters which I've taken up in about two minutes so that you get a refresher of everything, the most important things I said, and there'll be a little music in the background while you're listening to that. Students seem to really appreciate this when I do this on their lectures. If you don't want to watch that, there are timestamps and you can hop around. What else besides this short summary? There will be a list of references if you're interested in reading more about uh, in the academic literature dealing with drones. So stay tuned for that after the summary. I'm going to thank two of my colleagues, Elnas and Yunas, for some questions that they asked or some comments that have in part informed what I made in this video. And then there's, as usual, there's the credits and gear info at the end and where the music comes from. Uh, and then that'll be that. So, uh, I hope you found this video useful and, and interesting. And again, the usual thing about like, subscribes, and comments below, please. And thanks for your attention, and I'm looking forward to some interesting questions.